Yes. Yeah, so Sutton mm-hmm. Hill, when, when we were digging everything up, uh, what we found in Sutton Hill matches the uh, the actual the framework of the beginning of the saga of Beowulf. Beowulf was leaving a funeral, um, and they described the, the sitting king, and he is. Uh, I think I mispronounced that. Like, it's not Scythian; it's a Scythian king. Because I don't speak old English, <laughs> uh, but he's leaving mm-hmm. this big funeral that just happened, and mm-hmm. it actually describes the funeral in great detail. And it also describes in rel- in relation to where he's going, where it was located. Again, we thought, okay, cool, that that's great it's folklore. Well, Sutton Who is the actual funeral that he had attended? Now we have archaeological evidence of a real life event occurring that we had previously thought was just part of the story Mm -hmm. suddenly beowulf is being re-examined because well why would you tie in such a huge momentous event which it does happen a lot in folklore but then um there are other things that um I led to wondering okay well was hrothgar a real king was there an actual hall and we're finding yeah he was actually, wow, and right. there was an actual hall. Yeah, as as they, and then we're trying to figure out. Okay, so where was this hall located? Is that mm-hmm. important to the story? And it is actually important to the story, not only because oh my gosh, we're finding more and more the story was actually real. Um, but the where they think we don't know for sure, but where they are thinking the hall was located, this big party house, uh, the local acoustics of the valley would make sound reverberate very loudly and very clearly uh-huh. which um i do actually applaud the people who did the cgi movie they make that a point to establish it's the sound that bothers mm-hmm. grendel and draws him in and that makes sense if you think about it you live in a very nice remote Maybe like a remote farm is peaceful and quiet. You've got your fireflies, your crickets chirpy, and that's nice. And then a fry house moves in next door and starts partying at 3 a.m. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? Okay, you may not destroy their house and eat their people, but you're going to call the cops. Well, at that time, <laughs> he mm-hmm. is the police for the area, you know? And mm-hmm. and, it's, and the, the more we start to look at, okay, was this actually real? The more the whole story becomes very plausible. Because interestingly enough, at no point in the story is there anything really mystical or magical happening. It's mm-hmm. a very blunt, this could have literally happened story. But then you have to ask, okay, but then who was Grendel? What was Grendel? Mm-hmm. Because they differentiate him. He's definitely not homo sapien. Mm-hmm. And what were the characteristics that you saw in the story that made you think, well, maybe he was Neanderthal. Maybe he was humanoid. It was actually where he lived. It wasn't so much what he looked like. Um, it was more about where he lived. Because when Beowulf in the story goes in to confront his mother, Grendel's mother, what she's wearing uh, matches a lot of what we know Neanderthal women were to wear. The lots of shells, a lot of aquatic jewelry, aquatic clothing. They would use aquatic plants to weave into their hair and stuff. Um, and she is described as a water nymph. Well, I mean, if you don't know that this is Neanderthal woman who just that just happens to be her fashion choice, you'd probably think she is a water nymph because she also prefers mm-hmm. to stick near the water. Well, water mm-hmm. happens to give fish. Water is a good source for food and, and drink. So it mm-hmm. makes sense for her as a, a gatherer to, to stay where the gathering is good. Um, and she's probably bedecked in the same way that Neanderthal woman would have been bedecked. But also, when he goes in, the way he describes the the inner dwelling, the cave, which we know Neanderthals are prone to utilizing, uh, the layout of the slab, the flowers that are spread around um, her son's body, just, just all the little artifacts and details that are woven into that. You can look at pretty much any Neanderthal dwelling being ex- um, excavated today, and mm-hmm. they pretty much match. And that's what really made me go, okay, this th- this could be a thing. This mm-hmm. could definitely be a thing. Uh, we do know that Neanderthals did have a mourning process. They did have a concept of the afterlife. They did have a concept of death and grief. 
Um, and this is very much highlighted in the ending uh, parts of Beowulf. So we know that they had funeral rituals? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, actually, the flowers with the flowers being placed on top of or with uh, the dead, we can actually tie to Neanderthal culture. With Beowulf being tied to, you're tying Beowulf to Neanderthal, and mm -hmm. um, and Beowulf to uh, Sutton Who. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Sutton Who was about, shall we say, uh, off the top of my head, as a as a ballpark figure, around a thousand years ago. Maybe um, yes. We'll, we'll we'll say yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 around that give or take give or give or take a, a you know a couple of hundred years here and there I think. Um, so are you, are you are you saying there was Neanderthal around as recently as then? That's what we're trying to find out, and that's why we're doing the the, the DNA testing, and we're finding out the more people get tested, for, especially in Europe, for the Neanderthal gene the more the data is suggesting that if we keep testing, we could find yes, actually. Um, now, we also want, we also probably should clarify, there is a huge difference between a population and the last remnants. Uh -huh. um, if you, I mean, think of like uh, mm -hmm. zombie movies. Are there humans? Yes, but there's only, only probably like two. You know, like, so you can say, yeah, there are humans because the world's been taken run over by zombies. Mm -hmm. uh, but but there's only two of them. Like I am legend, he's he's like the last one as far as he knows. But there's still humans in the story. That's really what it what it is. And then it's actually mm -hmm. uh, I, I actually studied mm -hmm. zombies too. It's very interesting for this reason. Um, the way we we grapple with a colonization, <laughs> for example, sometimes you can actually use zombie uh, story structures to talk about that. We did actually. I am legend. Um, and uh, the last man on earth is more about that. Um, you think about you, you know what you know, and then a bunch of strangers come in and take over everything and wipe out everything that you know. And that does actually mm -hmm. echo probably Grendel's experience. It's just him and his mom. Like in the story they establish, it's just him and his mom. For all they know, they are the last of their kind. And you've got these weirdos moving in and destroying everything, mm -hmm. hunting their food, pillaging their land, noising everything up at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's it's very much an invasion that's happening. So Grendel, the Anathal, as an Anathal, could have very much been around only a couple thousand years ago. That doesn't mean that Neanderthals in general were. That could just mean that somehow his particular family managed to survive that lawn but no more because we know mm -hmm. that after Beowulf it is done. And what are the characteristics of Neanderthal? How are they different? Were they larger? I always picture them as larger and more and stronger. Like I think I I remember yeah. reading something that if you put a Homo sapien and a Neanderthal together in a fight, the Neanderthal the Neanderthal would definitely win because of its physical uh, attribution. Based on brawn and strength, yes. Uh, the Homo sapien could win based on uh, agility and and like more mental skills. Mm -hmm. We we don't know yet. Neanderthals, though, we're finding more and more are like extremely intelligent. Uh, but yeah, they were built differently, which harkens back to the concept of maybe that was part of the mark of skin. No one knows what the actual mark was in the story. It's never mm -hmm. described. And some people have wondered, was that literally a, ch a change in the skull, a change in the structure? Um, and it even says, you know, anybody who kills you or, or tries to kill you will be punished 70 times 7. Like, you know, they might try to kill you, but you'll be able to destroy them and their neighbors and their neighbors' neighbors and their neighbors. <laughs> and we know, like you said, from Neanderthal, well, that's very true. You could try to attack a Neanderthal, mm -hmm. but he'll probably wipe out you and your friends in like 30 seconds flat. And that's what happens in Beowulf in the story. Mm -hmm. um, he goes over and he wipes out the entire hall. There are no survivors except for maybe Hrothgar who probably limped away. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a very quick and it's a very bloody and it's a very brutal attack um, by mm -hmm. one, let's say Neanderthal who has no weapons. It's just sheer broad strength. 
So let's go into Tolkien because Tolkien was really interested in um, yes. Beowulf. Can you talk a little bit about why he was so interested and what what his work around Beowulf looked like? Yeah, I think I, I can't say for sure. This is like from what I got from his notes, uh, but I think it, it starts or started with the fact that he, at his very core, is a linguist. He was a linguistic expert. That's mm-hmm. how he wrote a lot of languages for Lord of the Rings. And Beowulf is the standard. Um, if you study English, English literature, if you study any English degree in America, even, a Beowulf is the standard, from what I've been told. You have to read it in the old English as well mm-hmm. as the current language and understand the translations because it's the oldest version. So Tolkien would have, by profession, needed to know it anyways. And mm-hmm. from what I found in his notes, just the, it's, it's more like how he wrote them. Not just that he wrote them, but how he wrote them. It seems like he was making a lot of these similar discoveries that I was starting to piece together. You know, like he was wondering, okay, what's pre-Christian, what's post-Christian influence? What is Mm -hmm. happening over here? Is it really a water nymph or is this just a grieving mother? How close to, you know, just a lot of, uh, he's focusing most in his uh, annotations, he's focusing more on the language. But out of the mm-hmm. language, he's pulling these questions. Most of the time, he doesn't really answer them. But I think he's just mm-hmm. trying to figure out the translations, trying to figure out the linguistic usage and cultural influences. Um, I think it, it just it seems like he started to ask all these questions that we're still trying to answer. The Old English version is written in poem version is is that correct is it a poem it's an epic saga way kind of like um homer with with the iliad okay so i i misunderstood that but in um when i was when i when i was reading your paper and i saw that tolkien was referenced i went and did a little wikipedia search and it said that he had he translated it two times one as an alliteration and then one as uh so is his version when when you say alliteration um how, how does that flow like what does that look like do you um there's there's two ways this happens a lot especially like the older the record is the more this happens because mm-hmm. the direct translation can oftentimes have gaps we just we either don't have actual words that translate mm-hmm. um i'm trying to think of which languages but there's a couple languages i have friends who speak native um they don't have a word for orange <laughs> you know, they, uh, or I actually have a friend from Saudi Arabia. They don't have a word for uh, um, Auburn, or they don't have a word for there's a there's a there's a that's a word that they have to describe a color that henna makes. It does not exist uh-huh. in English. That's what it is. It does not exist in English. So when she was talking mm. to me and trying to describe how she's getting her hair done, um, <laughs> yeah, and we see that mm-hmm. a lot when we're trying to translate ancient languages too because nobody speaks them like and in her case mm-hmm. i could probably find somebody else who speaks arabic and they could probably help her out like well it's kind of orange or whatnot um mm-hmm. but like we don't have any native sumerian speakers and we don't have mm-hmm. any native old english speakers so you'll see mm-hmm. a lot of um, cuneiform is a great example because there's only 13 people in the world last i looked who can even read it let alone translate it um, wow. And even then, they have to figure out, okay, do we agree that this is how it translates? Because we're the only 13 <laughs> people who, you know, there's no other panel of discussion. Um, and because we don't have a native speaker, there's a lot of gaps that occur. Um, and mm-hmm. so then we have to fill in those gaps for it to make sense. Um, mm-hmm. One of the recent ones with that is is a recipe for bread. We got to make sure we know how to we're, that were translated correctly because otherwise that bread recipe just isn't going to work um so yeah. with with tolkien that's what he's doing the first time around he's taking the old english and he's translating it to the absolute best of his possibilities as a linguistic expert and as someone who knows old english very very well and then identifying the gaps identifying the areas that not it's just not clicking like the sentence structure just doesn't really make sense but he knows mm-hmm. how it should make sense. And then going through and rewriting it in a way that we can digest it and get the actual story from it. Mm-hmm. We hope. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that is actually what happened with the Bible. Going back with that, people were like, well, the Bible's not true. So, 
Well, that actually happens because of this exact thing. It's, it's the translation part. It's trying to figure out how to make it cohesive to whoever is supposed to be receiving the information from a mm-hmm. language that nobody speaks anymore. Mm-hmm. And so uh, yeah. a lot of executive decisions were made <laughs> in the process of rewriting these translations. Right. And now we're fine. Now we do have experts who are very good in Aramaic. We have experts who are really good in ancient Hebrew. And we have Hebrew experts who are really good at kind of piecing these things together and finding out, oh, yeah, no, uh, Middle Age is a lot of executive and raw decisions were made to try to translate I refer, oh, no, that's not what that meant at all. And Tolkien is trying to avoid that with Beowulf. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, y- you were talking about the pagan b- versus post-Christianity. What what are elements in the story that um, m- made you start looking at that? Or Tolkien? Uh, yes. Um, I definitely, the one of the first notes I remember him having was on, well, when they're describing Grendel. Um, and actually, they're not even describing Grendel specifically. The first whole, if you think about it like a poem, like the the, the column, the first whole mm-hmm. column um, is actually, it's talking, it, it's, it's not talking about the creation of the world, but it's framing the introduction of the characters to come. So, and one of the first things it frames is the existence of who will be introduced as Grendel. So one of the first things that Beowulf even talks about is the descendants of Cain, of mm-hmm. the orcs mm-hmm. and the trolls and the dark elves, or even, yeah, the elvish and the orcish and the and the trolls. Yeah, there's a whole, it, it reads really, even in, in Old English, it is actually the elvish and the orcish and, and going through. Um, and they're tying that in because then later on, they'll be like, oh yeah, Grendel, yeah, he's this way because he's the descendant of Cain. Mm-hmm. Well, Cain and Abel is a biblical story. And that's a big question that comes up. As I mentioned earlier, was this framework introduced after the Christian missionaries mm-hmm. came or even after the, the empire came through? Or did they know about it already and mm-hmm. didn't need Christian influence? Was it part of their... Because if you remember, we're talking about the very beginning of this, uh, the Neanderthal branching off from Northeast Africa and going up. We do have that established. Is it possible? We don't know. We don't know the answer, but is it possible they carried with them that memory? We don't know. But that's definitely a big question that Tolkien had and he wanted to mark. There's also some linguistics that he marked that I am not an expert as I couldn't like directly quote, but there's just some uh, language usage that he noticed was very post-Christian in a very pre-Christian framed story. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. As a linguist, any, he, could, like, he could distinguish yes. those. Yes, well, mm-hmm. like, if you were to tell, tell somebody today, like, oh, can I have your number? Just call me. We're used to hearing that a lot. But you mm-hmm. wouldn't find, oh, just call me in a document from the 1400s. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you would see the like, come visit sometime or I shall send my servant. Mm-hmm. You'll, you'll find like different things, but it wouldn't be phrased like, I oh, just call me, text me. You know, yeah, mm-hmm. that, there's a good one. Like today, mm-hmm. like, oh, go ahead, go ahead and just text me. We'll see that all the time. But if that popped up in a text or like in, in an actual missive that you found from like 1493, you're going to wonder, okay, who translated this? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because they definitely mm-hmm. weren't from 1493. You know, like, that, and that, it was seems like that, <laughs> little things like that, where he's like, okay. There's some, there's something happening here. Uh, the Cain mm-hmm. one was a big one though. That was like a, a more of an unanswered question though, because mm-hmm. it, it's another. You feel like it that, that, Um, it could. It, it's one of those things that can swing either way. Mm-hmm. It could honestly swing either way. A lot of a lot of misconceptions people have today and always have is that uh, borderlands exist where they currently exist and have always existed. The 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 Mexican border is the one I always quote. People are always wondering, like, why are we having such a strong problem with immigration? Like, well, here's the thing. Borders only exist where the political powers place them. The political powers mm-hmm. are not eternal. They change all the time. Mexico mm-hmm. used to span all the way up to Canada, as mm-hmm. we ge- geographically know it. So you're not dealing with immigration issues. You're dealing with the fact that someone laid down an invisible fence that nobody can see, smack dab mm-hmm. in the middle of a 
eons long migration pattern of people who they would they would move because of the seasons it gets warmer over here the food's better over here and and even today with farming we still have that happen Mm -hmm. um with it when it comes to cultural references we see that a lot Uh, people are shocked to find muslim influence in scandinavia like well uh, the Vikings found some really efficient trade routes, <laughs> and they're just like, "I'm bored. I want to go get something good from down south." We came back up, had some great jewelry, awesome. Or maybe they picked up some things, but it happened without anybody else's help. Mm-hmm. And and so that's where Tolkien's also looking, like, how much of this happened because of the Christian expansion, or how much of it was already there? Because mm-hmm. it's still possible that could always already be there. We're a lot smarter than we give ourselves credit for, you know, like mm-hmm. we're capable mm-hmm. of doing a lot more than we give ourselves credit for. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what you're working on now um, and how your your culture anthropology informs your writing and whatever it is you're 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 working on. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I have a couple of different book series, two book series I've been working on. I have like 8,000 other story ideas in my head, um, but both of them actually <clears throat> pull from my research and just like a lot of the questions. I tell people, I don't really have answers mm-hmm. as much as I have questions that I like to play around with. Um, and so the one that they made last year was uh, the first book of the Garden of the Gods series on um, Prax and um, pulling from global mythologies and just kind of framing it like, okay, uh, in, in the in the very direct sense, what if they all just decided to retire <laughs> and could live in the least uh, active area of of North America? Um, and and that's the whole tagline. It's just like nothing. Ha- everything happens here because nothing happens here. You know, again, it's that assumption. Um, but it's also based a lot in in real life uh, cold cases that I have personally been there for. The first book actually. Co- um, was inspired by a still currently cold case of two missing girls who vanished from my hometown where we still don't know what mm-hmm. happened to them. Well, we know what happened to them, but nobody wants to talk about what happened to them. Again, going into fiction is not a very easy way to frame things because we're able to talk about right. things a lot easier. And actually that happened when, they were moved. <laughs> uh, that happened when Prax came out. Um, uh, we found a resurgence in trying to find out what happened to these girls. Nobody's talking about it. But I had some friends point out, it's interesting how we want to find out more information about what really, like, we're, we're restarting the search about a month after your book came out. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to leave, yeah. leave it at that. Uh, but the, the whole series, the Garden of the Gods series, actually also explores the concept of the, the gods of the ancient world. We call them gods. But again, taking a biblical record for account, um, the, the, the Bible talks about the gods as well, very openly. Um, and going all the way back to in, in Genesis as well, talking about the, the heroes of old, the, the demigods, who caused a lot of problems and then we had the flood. <laughs> uh, but there's this, I just have this question of like, well, what if? Because it even talks about there are angels, the principalities. A lot of that, that phrase gets misquoted a lot. There are a lot of uh, preachers, street preachers, who will say principalities as if they're demons. The Bible actually uses them as guardian angels of entire cities. That should sound familiar because it's exactly what Athena yeah. was. She was the, the right. you know, when we, we have this concept in Greek and Roman mythology, you have Athena, you have Athens, you have all these, well, that's also in the Bible. And so I had this question, like, well, how, how would it look if we just called, you know, if we just did it that way and you have, and, and so there'll, there'll be more into that. Um, but, but that's, that's something, uh, the first one is out Prax. The second one is Gorgo. That one I was supposed to have come out this spring and I Delayed it because my other series, the one I've actually been writing for 23 years, um, is based on the Tuatha Dé Danann and Fomorian legends, which is really fascinating. Highly recommend you get in. And I just realized I mispronounced it. I had a guy from Ireland tell me it's Tuatha Dé Danann. They, um, they are the, uh, the oldest people of Ireland. And that's another interesting pre-Christian, post-Christian influence debate having been had in scholarly discussion. Um, Post-Christian influence, they're considered the gods, the ancient gods of Ireland who 
um, then get demoted into the Aoshi or the Kaoshi and just basically become the she, the fae, the fae folk. Pre-Christian mm-hmm. record identifies them as just really, really advanced artists and they were just above and beyond uh, everything that we would ever expect from the ancient world and the Holy Roman em- Empire, which at the time was very political, not so much spiritual. <laughs> but they're saying, we're Christian. No, they're just political. Uh, they, they did not like, because that positioned the Tuatadawan as far more advanced than they were. And that's threatening. Um, there are records of St. Patrick in his own writing, mm-hmm. standing between them and telling the Holy Roman Empire, you got to go. And he and in his records, he made friends with the Tuatadawan. And they liked him. Uh, but what was really interesting, and what led me down this path to write The Song of the She, that's a series that just debuted this year, uh, was the Fomorians. So I was trying to figure out, like, okay, Tuatadawa and what's going on, and their, their long-standing um, hatred of the Fomorians. So the Fomorians were invaders. They came, and, and Fomor, again, I'm probably really grossly mispronouncing that. <laughs> so it's always like, it's not how you say it. Uh, but Fomor is from under. Yeah. Uh, and the Fomorian name is from Fomor, from under. And it's understood that they came out of the sea, from under the sea. But then I saw this phrase being used that made me go, oh my gosh, cook like the sea peoples. They're also described in folklore oh, wow. as the sea peoples. I don't know if you remember from earlier, but that phrase happens in other parts of the world. It had the sea peoples pop up mm-hmm. with the Hebrews in, in, Pal- in Palestine and Israel, you know, the Philistines, you know, Samson and, and David and Goliath and all that. Sea peoples also pop up in northern Egypt. They're invading from the ocean there as well. Well, they pop up in this record of Irish mythology, which we can pretty much date to around the same time. And they're just everywhere. And again, the Fomorians are in considered an invading force but the Tuatha Dao and the Fomorians also constantly intermarried uh-huh. a lot like it was, there was very much like we hate you we hate you you want to go uh mm-hmm. yeah okay cool and then <laughs> and, you know and then they, that happened um <laughs> but what rocked my world literally uh pens actually dropped in this one course I took it was one of the last courses I took in grad school and and I'm fair warning, your pens might drop too. Because I, I when I say my jaw could not lift off the floor, it was one. <laughs> they all have one connection. The sea peoples. We say like they came from fallen Mycenae. But why did Mycenae fall? It's because their military power was gone for a very long stretch of time, about ten to twelve years. We know where they were. Uh-huh. So you think the story of Samson and his fight against the Philistines, who were these people? David and Goliath, Goliath being Philistine, he's part of these people. You have the invaders north of Egypt. You have the Fomorians going against the ancient gods of Ireland. You have all the sea peoples can all be pinned back to Troy and the Trojan War. To Troy? Yes, which we do have established archaeological record was a real place that did actually exist, and the war probably did happen. Yeah, I've been there. Yep, <laughs> you've been there, Matt. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's in well, it's it's in Turkey, but I'm not. I can't quite yes. describe which which bit. Yes. But yeah, yeah. I've been been, been to Troy. Um, the, the, the the Sea Peoples. That was just uh, that that was not just sorry. That was a result of. The Bronze Age collapse, wasn't it? The Sea People. That was everything when everything was going, and it's I, I guess. Sorry, go on. Go on. Oh, the Sea Peoples, in so much as these records go. It's, I was, I was going to say it's. A, yeah. <laughs> so we got a, so we got a little bit of delay. I was going to say the Sea People is it's, it's kind of like a gang forming, um, yeah. in a in a in a poor. Yeah neighborhood yes yes it, every, every, everything's gone you know everything's collapsing no one's got any money and, and they're a group of people we oh we don't know who they are do we it's 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 kind of like a 
uh, a, a mixture of eventually they, and we I think we assume it's a mixture of yes eventually they do become a mixture, a mixture. of different people how, how do you know it's the same people who went to Ireland uh, I don't know they're the same people that went to Ireland what I found interesting was the same usage of the phrase and mm. in the timing of them showing up in Ireland I see who is really close to the timing that they show up in the Palestinian region which is also the same time they show up in northern yeah, northern egypt like, like it's just the timing and then why would you call them the sea peoples why can't you just call them i don't know those guys you know like, you're like why is it that particular word unless they're calling themselves that yeah and it's very possible um now we now there i agree with you like there's also a lot of migrations happening a lot of things that they definitely could have absolutely blended with other people this particular group we can establish with a strong set of certainty really were mycenaean um and as my one professor explained we can establish this both because the philistines are actually we know from like like literal paintings, definitely Greek, um, which was the you know, came out of Mycenae. Um, but we know from from the story of the Trojan War that they were at it at war for a very long time, and it took a bunch of them a very long time to get back. We have both the the Iliad and we have the Odysseys. We have long stretches of time where they're not yeah. home, and at that particular time. And it's interesting because the cost of what was happening is also taught against and and not just Hebrew record, but like other records. They're like, basically when they, um, I want to use this right. When Jesus said, don't hero worship, <laughs> it comes out of uh, a lot of other groups saying don't hero worship, mainly because that's exactly what Mycenae was doing right when the Trojan War started. They were hero worshiping. It was a huge honor and a huge uh, deal for you to be a warrior in the sense of you need to go kill people. You need to go to war. You need to go to battle. You need to do all these things. And what happened out of yeah. that was when the call for the war happened, well, everybody wants to go do that because it's their moment for glory and immortality. And it left the entire nation of Mycenae with just women and children. Time passes. What happens with children? They grow up. And obviously, they have to figure things out on their own. And, and we're one. We're smart. <laughs> we figure things out. <laughs> and so by the time the, the warriors come back, when those who survive, the, by the time they come back, I love how my professor put it, it's not their home anymore. A decade at least has passed. Their children are now adults. The government systems are now run by the toddlers they left behind, who are now grown men and grown women even their wives are grandparents now. Like an entire shift in evolution in society has occurred. And you have all these warriors returning what they knew, what they loved, what their culture and their existence even was about no longer exists. They are basically homeless. And there's just one particular thing they know how to do very well, and that's set sail. And so they, yeah, and mm -hmm. off, off they went as... I guess almost, uh, almost, pi pi uh, almost like pirates. Yeah, almost very much, sort of very thing, much. Uh, I was, I, I was just trying to think. Um, I was, I was thinking, well, it's a long way from the Mediterranean to to Ireland, but we know that um, people from the Mediterranean around that time, around the Bronze Age, um, yep. went to Cornwall. Which is the sort of southwest, the most southerly point almost of, uh, of 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 the UK. We know they came, and then we know the way they came because they they, mm -hmm. they were trading tin, um, you know, to to make to make bronze. You know, tin being um, yeah, it's yes. all over the place in Cornwall. You can't you can't throw a stone without hitting right. an old t tin mine. Um, and it's not it's it's just a short trip really from uh right. from, from Cornwall to and over to you Ireland. So if they could come up from the Med, Mediterranean to Cornwall, then Ireland is is uh, well within the the. And the we know that's possible because of the Mediterranean borderline France and Spain. We know that the Roman Empire definitely hit Spain. So if, if you you can figure out if one group of people figure it out, you can easily surmise other groups of people figure it out. That hey, we could sail through here, stop over here. Well, lots of stopovers. Basically, you just hop. You you sail for a time. You go where the coastal is, 
Next thing you know, here's England. You know, you're Britannia at the time. Yeah. Like you said, go up to Cornwall, go all the way over. Yeah. Um, which is another thing that's fun when uh, my hometown in Iowa has the 10th largest Irish festival in in the whole nation oh, every year. Yeah. It's, it's great. Uh, and there are a lot of Scots, the Scots folk there. Uh, my my father's side is Scottish, but my mother's side is Irish. <laughs> and I, I would go and they're like, why are all these you know, kilts around? Why are all these uh, Scotsmen around? Why are the Scottish here? And we're like, well, as, as actually one Irish person told me, well, mm. the distance between Ireland and Scotland is basically a puddle. <laughs> you know, and you got your trade yeah. and the, la- the language is so similar in many ways. You can easily identify, oh yeah, they figured out they were neighbors a long time ago. They like their respective homes, but there's a lot of, you know, trading of cups of sugar happening. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, it depends. There's a whole Catholic pro- pro- Protestant thing going on between be- be- yep. between yep. Uh, between yep. the two as well. Um, I mean, there was uh, talk, talk about that the, the journey from there's there's a wonderful legend from Cornwall, um, and I suspect it is just that is it is legend. But um, the, the the Cornish uh, are very you know the, the the Christian Cornish are very proud of the fact that they believe anyway that. Jesus um, came with Joseph of Arimathea to trade tin in Cornwall, um, and there's little legends all the way through about that about that journey um, near. I don't know if you know Glastonbury Tor. Near Glastonbury Tor, um, there's a um, ah, okay, it's jo- Joseph. It's, it's it's supposed to be the place where Joseph of Ar- Arimathea uh, thrust his okay. staff. Um, into the ground, and now there's a very oh, old neat. tree still growing there. It grew That's out so from neat. his staff. Um, right the way through the UK, there's various little stories of, uh, and there's a very famous song that I can't. I'll put it in. The, I'll think of it and I'll put it in the show notes. Um, it's a famous hymn um, that was written about uh, about Jesus visiting okay. the UK. But I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the show okay. notes, and we can. Vanessa's back. You disappeared, <laughs> Vanessa. I my my Chrome crashed, and I wasn't oh, hearing no. anything anyone was saying. And then I got a notification that I had to leave. Anyway, so I fixed it. I restarted the the phone, Yay! and it seems to be working I'll now. Look at that. so, that's why I just disappeared. <laughs> but I'm glad y'all were able to continue the conversation. It sounds like you had a very interesting yeah. combo. Oh, I can oh, talk about yeah. this for yeah, hours. I was like, that, this is a whole <laughs> other potential episode. But you really want to make people mad, and I know, I know for a fact it makes people bad because I mentioned it on TikTok. Talk and wow, did I get bashed by archaeologists? Um, mm-hmm. I had a lot of stitching happen, a lot of stitching happen. I'm like, she said, and what's funny is, I'm like, I can tell you guys aren't used to oral tradition because you didn't listen to a darn word I said. <laughs> um, um, but you said, so what was it that made people mad? What did you say that made them mad? I want to write a book one day after I get us all pulled together called "The Mormons Were Right and Other Unpopular Archaeological Opinions." Because <laughs> um, it, it really, really quick. Cause I have family who who is Mormon, so I know a lot from them, and also just it's an American thing, and now they're global. But there's uh, there's this idea, like you said, like Jesus popped up in Cornwall. Well, here in North America, the the Church of Christ of Latter Day Saints, uh, the Mormons have uh, this idea that Jesus came to North America. And there was also like a huge war between these two peoples and one of them lost. And that's where we got the slaves. Like it, it's, yeah, there's a lot of political racist overtones, but there's also just like that they think this really happened. And there's uh, Moroni and there's just a, a lot happening. But one of the things that people are just like, what, this is crazy. You made it up. Is that there's a lost tribe of Israel. So there's not 12 tribes, there's 13 or depends on who you talk to. Some say there's 12 tribes but only 11 of them stayed there. The 12th one came over here. However you put it, and this is where it gets the kind of personal life heard Mormons say either way. Uh, In my own family, they they split on what that was. Um, But there's this idea that you have people from Israel coming over to America. And as you you said, you you think it's a long shot Mm -hmm. between Mycenae and Ireland. <laughs> it's a really long shot between anything in Europe and in mm-hmm. the ancient world all the way over to North America. So people are like, no, there's no way. And, and we all know Hebrews right. hate water. Like they have reasons for hating water. They don't sail. Guess what we're finding? 
<laughs> scattered all over North America. And one of these They're artifacts seeing. is actually here in Chicago. And people debate on if it even exists, but I've seen things. Like I when I was studying here in the Chicago area from archaeology, I was very privileged to go into one of the warehouses for the Field Museum, which expands six miles underneath the lake. It is very top secret. It is. I, and I had, I had archaeologists yelling at me and museum people yelling at me for saying that. They're like, hey, that's the old idea is like that makes it toxic. And I'm like, no, no, actually, there are museums that do actually keep very top secret under lock and key. You cannot talk about what's in there. Warehouse 13 level stuff to, pre- to prevent people from going and stealing it. Mainly that's what it is. It's to prevent mm-hmm. theft. Um, so I have actually been into one of those mm-hmm. areas. I can't really talk about what was under there. He didn't let us go in the really super top secret. But I'm watching this documentary about this artifact found in Chicago, actually right by where I used to live, downtown. And they're saying, well, we took it to this top secret place. And they're kind of giving hints. I'm like, well, I know where that is. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> you know. Um, and it is a Canaanite sacrificial altar. And there's no arguing. It's Canaanite. But the other term for Canaanite is Phoenician. So you'll hear the word Phoenician used a lot more here. But I'm like, what is Phoenician? I have to remember, go through it. No, Phoenicia is a fancier word for Cana and the Canaanites. And we know from biblical record that the Israelites had a very, very common problem of blending in with the Canaanite culture and the Canaanite people in the language far more than God wanted them to, and far more than their uh, spiritual leaders wanted them to. And now we're finding, and it's not just in Chicago, we have uh, we have a Phoenician slash Canaanite uh, temple sort of set up that we found in, in the Boston region. Um, and there's other places that we're finding, like, this isn't Native American, like, this isn't Iroquois, this isn't Powhatan, like, this isn't what we know here. This is very Canaanite. And actually in Arches mm-hmm. National Park, I I personally went to uh see one of their actually their big the big arch that's usually seen with like uh their merchandise and stuff like that. My my father took me out there. And on the way up they have uh I forget the term. They're they're just they're etchings from the ancient people who were there before, you know. Um, and I'm looking at that and I was actually in my archaeology studies at that time. So I had my textbook and I'm looking at it. I'm like, dad, that is so Canaanite. Like, I don't understand this time. I didn't know about all these other discoveries, but we're in the middle of Utah in the middle of the desert. I'm looking at this mm-hmm. and I'm like, why are drawings from my biblical archaeology textbook on this particular wall? Like that is, that's how the Canaanites drew cattle. That's how the Canaanites drew people. And I've heard arguments <clears throat> like, well, it's just an efficient way to draw cattle. You know, you can't say it's purely Canaan. I'm like, no, I've seen how other people around in the ancient world draw cattle and they're very round and there's other ways. You see like the, the cave dwellings in France and stuff. They have their own ways of drawing livestock. The Canaanites were very, very particular, just like the Egyptians are very, very particular in how they drew things. And you're seeing Canaanite drawings show up in North America. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it, and it ticks off a lot of people because they don't want to entertain the idea. I don't know why. I actually don't know why. I don't know why nobody wants to even entertain the idea that we could have spread a lot more than we originally thought. But I think I think it's going back to if you mm-hmm. if folklore and mythology and fantasy fact. Well, we have to start rewriting what we thought we knew. And we don't like change as a species. We're very anti change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we like our patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But no, I mean, we, we don't like the fact that Christopher yeah. Columbus didn't discover North America. Mm-hmm. We don't like that. Not even the Vikings. Actually, we're thinking the Tuatha Dao may have discovered North America before. <laughs> Vikings did. We're finding some linguistic records that suggest you know all these different things. We don't like pulling fact fantasy. But like you said, it's easier. It's easier to digest important themes when it is actually fiction, and so it's often you know intertwined together. So it's very difficult to pull them apart. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, and, and we do that today just, just to handle these things. So, so yeah, so I, and I threw in that Phoenicians in America theme because were they sea peoples? 
We don't know. Were, did the sea peoples actually reach that far? We don't know. But we do know that we have a lot of folklore mm-hmm. that come from the sea peoples. My gosh, the story of Hercules is definitely a product of the sea peoples trade. And we have the Twa the Dawn and the Fomorian struggle and all the f- fantasies and fairy tales, Baylor and and Lug and all those, you know, come out mm-hmm. of <clears throat> a very real life event that we just kind of mystify. A, a really, really good book that kind of shows us in a four instead of like looking backwards, actually looking forward is uh Oh my! Oh my gosh! <laughs> it's like a really good book, and then the the, the title just flew out of my brain. Uh, the world, the and Earth abides. That's what it's called, and Earth abides. And it, it starts in modern day, and a, a virus has gone through and basically wiped out the whole population, except for this one guy who happened to be camping up in the hills, and he missed the spread. Um, and there's a couple other people who survive. But what makes it so fascinating and really kind of gives a good perspective, even though it's fiction, it gives a good perspective, and it's the reason why a professor had us read it, is it shows the progression of fact into folklore. And it shows how, like, a simple tool that he had on hand from his toolbox, like a hammer, that it was, like, the only thing he had to defend himself with. It's the only thing he had. Like, it's a basic, you know, stick with metal on the end. By the time the book ends, he's basically Thor now. <laughs> you know, he's basically Thor wielding this <laughs> mighty wall near his card from the, and it just shows, but it shows a very logical progression mm-hmm. from, hey, dad's hammer is dad's and you can't touch it because it's his, to, hey, grandpa's hammer is kind of important, you know, that like, you can't touch it because it's his. And I have great child, grandchildren, great great grandchildren mm-hmm. who are like deifying the hammer but we know from the beginning of the story it was just a hammer it was just what mm-hmm. he happened to have in hand and so it brings up in, in mm-hmm. anthropologists why again why the professor had us read it brings up this question how much of our mythology and our folklore is the result of generational distance from very factual events mm-hmm. how much of uh, that that's why i'm so fascinated by the mm-hmm. concept of the gods really just being angels who decided to stay here. You know, how much of the stories we have of Athena really are just distance from a time when angels did walk the earth and guard the cities and people forgot who God was. And we don't know. You know, it's just, it's just a lot of different things going on there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just very just fascinating to me. And so I start writing my own ideas into, into stories that win awards and, <laughs> and get fans. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is so, it is so fascinating. Well, I feel like we could stay here all day, but we, we've gone quite over a bit of an hour. So do you want to throw out um, where people can find you? Yes. If you're looking for my books and just me as a person, as an author, uh, NikkiAuberkit.com is my new website. I just put it up. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Nikki Um I am also uh, a developmental editor eh. <laughs> and i and i own an editorial company so i work with self-publishing I work in independent publishing and so uh tallaeditorial.com is a great way to learn more about what that looks like um especially for someone who who really does want have stories to tell but you don't want to wait to tell them it's a really good avenue to mm-hmm. pursue um and we're all about preserving stories so Well, that just sounds amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a a fantastic conversation. I feel like we could definitely have more conversations about other topics at another (laughs) time. I'm always open (laughs) to angry archaeologists everywhere. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Great. (laughs) All right. Well, um, so I also want to thank our listeners Um, for joining us today on another episode of Fabric of Folklore. If you enjoyed the show, make sure that you like, subscribe, and give us all the stars, especially if you are on listening on iTunes. Please share with someone, even if it's just the next person that you're sending it next to in the elevator, uh, because As we talk about in folklore, uh, words have power. And so uh, sharing with other people is how we get listeners. And let us know what your favorite part of the show was on our Facebook uh, group page. Um, and a re- uh, Oh, yes. And I think that is it. Um, so thanks so much. And we look forward to uh, our next show. Yeah.